Hello and welcome to the Refugee Engagement Podcast, where we explore the critical issues and innovative ideas shaping the future of education. I'm Abdul Salam Amor. In this episode, we are diving into the dynamic world of teenage education. Adolescence, as we all know, is a pivotal age of development, and how we educate our teenagers can profoundly impact their futures. Our guest today is Dr. Anito Dali, the Executive Director at Children Impact and Development Initiative, an organization committed to promoting the welfare and development of children, teens, and young adults. With extensive experience in supporting the holistic growth of young people, Dr. Dali will share insights on the unique challenges and opportunities in educating teenagers, the role of mental health, the impact of technology, and much more. Hello, Dr. Dali. Good day. Good day. All right. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to ask by, start by asking about what the organization, the approaches your organization uses in addressing the unique educational needs and challenges faced by teenagers today. Thank you very much. Um, we encourage the training and retraining of teachers and educational facilitators because um, it is apparent that one cannot give what one does not have. So the system of using half-baked teachers, half-baked uh, instructors and facilitators is really having a toll on the teenagers, the young learners. So we are encouraging training and retraining and we're also carrying out training and retraining of teachers in communities. We're also making materials, reference materials available for teachers and also motivating young people to embrace the need uh, to be educated. Because one thing that is lacking also is the vibrancy of the younger generation in embracing education. I remember some time ago, some years back, my son came back from school and came back with the slang, education has come. My heart bled that day. The education has come. So, unfortunately, the flaunting of wealth without hard work, the flaunting of uh, easy positions and uh, achievements without education, it has bedeviled the society and has made young people to, uh, to, to lack the motivation to study. When we were younger, the world made it seem like once you're educated, you are, you are successful in life. But right now, it's a reverse that is in the society. A reverse such that people see other people being celebrated as successful and uh, achievers without them being educated. So it's really taking it all. And then parents are too busy to be the supportive arm that the ch young people need to lean on. They no longer have the support of their parents in uh, doing the assignments and all that. So we're also engaging in uh, massive advocacy for parents to be involved, more involved in the lives of their children so that they can encourage them to study. Many, uh, this advent of technology, the uh, improvement in technology where everybody is focused on pressing the phone and all that. Parents are encouraged to themselves take up reading and love for education seriously so that they can model that for their children. All so right. those are some of the strategies we've been engaging to increase uh, interest in education for young people. Okay. Let's talk about social media and digital technology and its impact on education and the development of teenagers. The, the impact of social media particularly is far-reaching. In as much as we can say uh, technology on a broad level has uh, increased uh, availability of resources, has increased the uh, reach for edu uh, being educated, being informed and all that. But unfortunately, the disadvantages too is very, very gruesome. You find that the young people are carried away with social media, extremely carried away, and uh, time is being wasted doing non-profitable things. 
priorities are not being set in the use of this uh, social media and technology in its wide range, you find that that uh, more time is wasted in doing unprofitable ventures on social media. It is very sad that children are not guided at a very young age. They are exposed to social media. They are given gadgets and other technical uh, technology devices, and they just do just about anything they want. There's no caution. There's no guide in the use of social media and technology for children. It is very sad. And this uh, negative effect overrides many times the positive effects of these uh, um, devices and platforms, as it were. They use the term children a lot here. Can we say that teenagers are children or adults? <laughs> teenagers are teenagers. I call them in-between people. They are in-between children and adults. They are not adults. Yeah. And of course, what a teenager will exhibit starts from what the ch a child has been nurtured with. So that's why I always like to go back and mention children. So when we begin to get it right, when they are children, it will be easy to build upon those things when they become teenagers. And that is what will uh, translate and you see in their lives as young adults and then adults invariably. So we need to focus on the children as we're focusing on the teenagers so that we know where we have missed it with the teenagers when they were children and begin to correct that foundation so that the foundation can be solid for when they are teenagers and then, of course, when they become young adults and then adults. What role does mental health play in the academic success of teenagers? And how can schools better support uh, the mental well-being of their students? It plays a lot, a lot. Before now, unfortunately in our society, we, we shied away from mental, discussing mental well-being, mental wellness and all that. We shied away. And, and um, because uh, we attributed mental well-being to uh, the man on the street that is naked and roaming the street, his hair rough and all that, not without realizing that to a very large extent, so many people from children up until adults have suffering from one form of mental disorder or mental unwellness if that will sit right with people or the other. Now, in as much as nurturing of children, their mental well-being and all starts from the home, the responsibility starts with the parents in the home. The uh, school as co-stakeholders in nurturing of, of children can do so much. A lot of things go on in the school environment. A lot of things. And the one that we are more, we have more recently encountered in our society is bullying. Bullying will definitely affect the mental health of a child. Coincidentally, the person bullying another child also has an issue with their mental health, well-being. That is it. So children, the school should be alert to the way children behave, the way they respond, whether to their peers or to the teachers, the way they respond academically, the way they're able to relate socially. The school should be interested in that so that they can help uh, um, the child to maintain a, a, a mental well-being. Now, the environment of the school. You have some schools, particularly secondary schools, where the school does not even provide the basic amenities that has been paid for. Imagine having a school that has no water and children have to go miles and miles before they get access to water. Imagine a school where the seniors are overly wicked to the younger ones and make them do all kinds of chores for them when they are supposed to be studying. All of those things have takes its toll on the mental well-being of children. There must be rules and regulation in every school, and there must be consequences. Children at the uh, registration of being uh, uh, admit had been admitted in the school must be made to understand the rules guiding the uh, living or coexistence amongst themselves, and they should know that there will be consequences. These are more are what will help uh, the school to be able to help children maintain a, a, a mental well-being as they reside as students in the school. How do we address the issue of academic pressure and its effect on teenagers' overall well-being and motivation? Okay, how do we address it? You find, uh, unfortunately, our curriculum over the years that I've looked at the school curriculum, our school curriculum is packed with uh, things that are not uh, uh, relevant for the survival of these children outside of the uh, school academic environment. 
it, the what they are being taught in school does not help them fit into the society properly. It does not help them uh, 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 impact the society as it were. So we need, to, first and foremost, we need a curriculum review. We are a curriculum we contain things that will that are directly related to the survival of these children, of these teenagers in the general environment. We need it. And then the, the strategy, the method of teaching also has to, has to change. Back when we were younger, if you were not good at mathematics, you could go for courses that did not require mathematics for you to study. Every child cannot be good in mathematics. But what we have these days is an environment where you say, before a child can get into a higher institution, he or she must pass uh, maths and uh, English, must do well in maths and English. Every, every child can shine, but every child will not necessarily shine the same way or in the same uh, area. So if a child will shine in sciences, then the child needs to be able to do mathematics properly. I was in a school recently for uh, uh, um, a leadership uh, motivational talk with the children and I gave room for counseling after my talk. Over 50% of the children that came to talk with me ex expressed their difficulty in the mathematics subject. But unfortunately, these children are not going to be spared that burden because they need to do well in maths and English before they can even study law before they can study English. I think that's a burden that uh, our children should not be made to bear. It's, it, 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 it's not relevant. Mathematics is not relevant to every subject. And two children cannot do well in a particular area. They must be allowed. The environment must be such that they are allowed to, uh, 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 to shine in their comfort zone. They are allowed to thrive and not, not just put unnecessary obstacles in their path. You find some schools, they load uh, assignments to children. Assignments that even the school teachers cannot mark. During this holiday that finished, I was on vacation in my village. And uh, my, one of my nephews was around. My very small nephew, 10 year old. The assignments he was given, holiday assignments he was given. He, he did not bring it out on time. A few days to resumption. He could not even solve those quantitative uh, uh, is it, I've forgotten quantitative, I've forgotten how the technical questions. Yes. Do you know that those questions were shared to all his aunties, his elder sisters that were already graduates? They were the ones that uh, understood it and then began to explain to him, this is a child that had gone to school the whole time and then is on holiday and then is giving that kind of schoolwork. I don't think it, it counts. These days we can see children, we can see adults, people, uh, young adults, teenagers, we can see people doing well in sports. Uh, the Aisha is he, Oswalale or something, Oswala in, in, in female or male football. Yes, different kinds of, so everybody I can shine. Do you sorry. think that Aziza, does Aziza need maths to shine as a footballer? So that we can all shine at different levels. So saying that a child must pass English and maths, I think is an unnecessary obstacle in the path of the child. Then only giving them a bulky curriculum is not going to, is not, is, is not helping them. And then burdening them with uh, curriculum content that has no bearing to their direct survival in everyday life. I think those are so much, too much things, too much obstacles we put in their way for the um, um, delaying or disturbing them from shining or excelling as it were. I slightly disagree with you. You said that uh, mathematics is not that relevant. At least at the basic level, they, they, they require some knowledge of mathematics at the basic level. So you yeah, still want to become doctors or some other things. So they still I'm not overriding that. I'm not overriding that, the importance of mathematics. I'm saying that if a child at the end of the day finds out that he or she is not doing so well in mathematics and wants to take a course that is not directly relevant, that mathematics is not directly relevant with, then that such a child should be allowed. Okay. Putting an obstacle at university entry to say every child must pass maths and English, I think is an overkill. That's my point. Okay, I got it. I'm interested in so, out after this one, after this episode, the next episode is on mathematics. Making mathematics interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so how can educators and parents collaborate in creating a supportive and nurturing uh, learning environment for teenagers? A beautiful one. I think uh, 
the school, the home, they are bedfellows that must <laughs> that must agree for the sake of the children. Now, the child, the parents must be overly involved in the lives of their children. They must know what they are being taught in school. They must be involved in every area of their academic uh, life. They must be there as guides, as counselors for these children. In a situation where uh, parents just leave the academic well-being of their children in the hands of the school, then you can't get the best. One of the things I tell parents is that they must be able to create a good learning environment, even in the home. You find that out some in some homes, when children want to do their assignments, the parents want to send them errands. When children, are uh, teenagers, are having exams or uh, uh, the CA, cumulative assess assessment in school, the parents deprive them of an environment where they can study properly. So I always encourage parents to create a good learning environment for children. When they are doing their assignments, it's not the time for parents to be sending them errands. When they have cumulative assessment, when they have the examinations, there are times where the parents should help the children see the importance they attach to education by ensuring that the environment is very conducive. So parents and the school need to work together. There must be an interface. A situation where the uh, PTA meeting is only reserved for uh, lodging complaints and complaints of all kinds of things with the school is not going to benefit the children. There must be a time where parents and teachers have an interface on the improved learning, on creating improved learning environment, materials and facilitators for the children and teenagers. Earlier you shared some insights into some activities of the organization. Can you talk about okay. some initiatives that you have carried out to enhance the educational experiences of teenagers? We go, we visit schools, we pay incessant advocacy, uh, advocacy visits to schools, helping children to understand the importance of education. We have provided all kinds of materials and books. Uh, there's this uh, material that we provided, studying and timing, is uh, a, a, a material that encourages teenagers on the need to study, to develop study skills, and to manage their time. Because the greatest problem the teenagers have is in the managing of their time. While they are caught up doing other things, they lose track of time and they are not able to use their time judiciously and it affects them in their academics. So we pay incessant and consistent advocacy calls to schools. We donate materials to school libraries. We donate books and materials to school libraries that will help teenagers and guide them towards embracing the, the, the need to improve upon their study study and academic achievements. We also train teachers. We provide platforms where teachers can, can get have access to better quality materials that we guide the strategies that they will use in, in, in their teaching and divorce. So these are some of the things that we have been doing over the years. We also visit communities. We even started some reading clubs in certain communities so that community children can uh, develop their reading skills so that it will help them improve their academic pursuits. Let's get to um, getting these students, these uh, teenagers that are disinterested or disengaged from the traditional educational uh, educational approaches. What strategies can be can be adopted in engaging them? Hmm. We, like I told you, that we work in communities. We pay we pay courtesy, we pay visits, and we have uh, bi weekly meetings with these children, helping them to see the need to get educated. Uh, we, the, 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 two, the two ends of the candle that we can keep working at is in talking to the parents and also talking to the children, motivating children, the teenagers, to be, uh, to be more uh, alive to embracing education and also encouraging parents to be supportive. And uh, we are trying to create a scholarship platform where we can support children, we can support teenagers, whether when they need to take exams or so that we can be part of their journey into getting higher education. I think many parents are frustrated, those that are interested are frustrated by the, the economic uh, 
status as it were that will not allow them to further the education of these teenagers so we are talking to teen parents to be more alive to the responsibility of sponsoring these children in recent times we have had to sponsor some uh, teenagers to learn certain skills when their families could not contribute to the uh, furthering the education we uh, into the tertiary level and i would want to say at this level that education is way beyond the four walls of the classroom is more than that i also belong to an organization project impacts i'm the director of education in that uh, in that organization and that organization to where emphasizing the fact that education should not only be limited to the four walls of the classroom and at different levels we are encouraging there was a donation we made to some schools we donated old uh, textbooks you know, school sandals things like that that we are doing to encourage young people to encourage teenagers to embrace education our environment is not very encouraging you find uh, you find the uh, gifts that are given to all kinds of people engaging in all kinds of social activities uh, that is very robust gifts but when it comes to education you find out that the rewards that we attach to educational pursuits and uh, achievements is very poor this does not encourage the teenagers this does not encourage the children or young adults to pursue education at all costs. So, uh, how do we de uh, develop uh, critical life skills in these teenagers? Hmm. The, the teenagers are at a very stage in their lives, a critical stage in their lives. And like you asked me the other time, I said, I kept saying children children, 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 knowing that when we get it right with the children, then it will be easy for whatever we have planted in them to uh, help them when they become teenagers and then young adults subsequently. The only thing that we can do to encourage uh, teenagers to the life skills that we can help them achieve is just develop first to develop a relationship with them. Like the study and timing I was telling you, time management is a life skill giving priorities to uh, learning to prioritize your time learning to prioritize when you're making decisions these are life skills that everybody needs to embrace and we can only do that by uh, giving the right information to children that's why we partner with schools recently another organization that i'm also part of women community in africa where i'm the vice president we wrote a letter today to the secondary education board so that we can partner with them on the social education of children in schools we want to have access to be able to go to schools and help with uh, these life skills life skills are critical a, ch a child must learn a teenager must learn to prioritize in making decisions must learn to manage his or her time must learn certain skills even even, even hygiene personal hygiene skills are life skills because a child that is uh, riddled with disease will not be able to achieve anything so these are skills that are critical. Learn to live a, a life of hygiene. These are the things that the social skills, the social education, we want to be able to give to our children. So we need the parents on the home front to be alive to giving this, uh, this uh, education in partnership with the school and, of course, the society at large in, so that the teenagers can get the right information when they make decisions. All right. So what role do extracurricular activities um, play in the holistic development of teenagers? In fact, you have said it all even in that question. Extracurricular activities will encourage the holistic development of children. Like I mentioned earlier, I was mentioning the football, the football champion, the the athletes, and all that. Those extracurricular activities helps to discover talents in children. I said earlier, I said every child can shine. Every child. It's just the area that differs. So when we introduce these extracurricular activities, it helps children to be able to shine. A child that is not shining in mathematics can shine in, in, in Scrabble, can shine in chess, can shine on the field, either the football field or the athletic field. We need these extracurricular activities, like you said in the question, for the holistic development of children. Encouraging children to be part of the debates uh, uh, debates uh, society uh, in the in the sports uh, group and all that would then will 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 showcase this child or we open up this child to be able to achieve and impart lives through 
talent that are inherent in those child, those children. So inherent abilities can be discovered through extracurricular activities. When we create platforms, opportunities for our teenagers to engage in extracurricular activities, instead of locking them up in the house, instead of restricting them all of the time, we should ensure that they engage in extracurricular activities either in school or at home. In my estate where I live, all kinds of extracurricular activities are available for children. There's a table tennis that is put there for children. We allow them, there's a field for them to play. There's an opportunity for them to learn boxing. There's there's a whole lot. And my organization, we, organ, we put together a summer camp where teenagers come in and they can do just about anything. They get involved in uh, broadcasting the news. They get involved in, in games and uh, all kinds of activities so that holistically they can be developed and exposed. Um, we have schools and most of the day during the weekdays and children spend most of the time in school and on weekends they spend time a lot in their communities with their friends and in these situations issues of bullying and peer pressure come up. How can we ensure that this does not significantly uh, impact the educational experiences of these teenagers? Okay. Uh, it first starts with us helping our, our teenagers to develop a healthy self-esteem. I've, 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 I mentioned a little earlier when I was talking about mental well-being, that the child that is being bullied will have a distortion with the mental well-being. And the child that is already bullying, because hurt people hurt people. A child that has been hurt is a child that will want to hurt another child. So when we help our children develop a healthy self-esteem, by being there to protect them, by ensuring that they are not exposed to unnecessary danger, then we begin to, we have begun the process of helping them so that they don't become a menace in the society. I said parents breed bullies when they are overindulgent, when they are not involved adequately, when they are practicing permissive parenting, they help to be bullies that destroy the fabric of our society. When children from the home are nurtured properly, are uh, nurtured in the area of self-discipline and respect for others, you help you set boundaries. In the home, you find certain homes where the children can just pick the mother's phone and begin to fiddle with it and play with it. I know a, a, a parents leave, some parents leave their phones for children and the children can delete all the contacts there. They leave their phones for children to watch cartoons endlessly on their phones. I think that that process is not, is not nurturing, it's not love. It's not a show of love when you leave your handset for your child to fiddle with. You are not helping the child to understand boundaries. And that is the reason why we now have bullies in the society. Mm. Our children must be brought up to respect boundaries so that they know that with other people's things, you take permission. You don't go beyond what the other person wants you to do and things like that. They must learn to knock your door before they come in. They shouldn't just be allowed to do just about anything at any time they want. Eating, sleeping, reading is something that must be mapped out for them to follow. That is self-discipline. So when we raise our children, to have self-discipline, self-esteem, understand boundaries, and have a sense of responsibility. Those children will not go out and become a, a menaces in the society, bullying other people and pressuring their friends that they come across. So on the other hand, a child that has been nurtured to have a healthy self-esteem will know how to shield his or herself from bullying and unnecessary pressure. Such a child will not just want to belong because another problem that teenagers have is they want to belong. They want people to be their friends. So they are ready to do just about anything to be accepted by other people. But when we bring up our children to be comfortable in their own skin, to know their own worth and be comfortable. If you don't, don't like me this way, it's your loss, not mine. You don't need to change yourself for anybody. When we bring up children with healthy self-esteem, uh, self self-confidence, then the impact of peer pressure will be greatly reduced on them. These children will not suffer the impact of uh, bullying. And when it wants to rear its ugly head, they know to report and get the attention of significant adults in their lives. You seem to be placing the responsibility on the parents in this case. The bullying <laughs> Definitely. Down. So what can school do Teenagers spend the highest number of time at home with their parents. The school and the parents are joint bedfellows in the nurturing. But the, the teenager will exhibit in the society at large must be laid in the home. 
and then the school must build upon the foundation that has been laid at home. They are trying to say that the foundation is laid from the home, and uh, and then it is based on that that the school will now build on it. But then, definitely, like, there was a recent situation that in a somewhere in Abuja, <laughs> and some other places, not only in Abuja, it has happened at some other places. In some cases, with parents even accusing the school of killing their children in, in Lagos, I think Lagos, two cases in Lagos. Uh, so and some other that, places. That is this. <laughs> That is the sad reality that we are faced with today. My people say a proverb. They said, in your column, be more, he buy in your loan. So, meaning that only one person gives back, but it takes 200 other persons to raise that child. But the society that we have now, parents want to raise the children themselves. That's why the fact that they don't have the, 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 the knowledge needed, the skills, they don't have the time, and all that is it takes they only majorly focus on the financial upbringing the financial requirements for the upbringing of their children excluding every other thing but that means that we're going to have half baked children children teenagers that have not been nurtured well teenagers that will rob us the society at large of the peace that we need in our society one person gives birth but it is the responsibility of 200 others to raise that child successfully. Talking about raising uh, the child, the children successfully, the role what is the importance of career guidance and vocational training in education of teenagers, and how can this uh, be integrated into the curriculum? This is very huge. The impact is huge because the guidance counselor as the name implies, is to guide and counsel the teenagers. When a child starts off, the parents are supposed to be observant enough to see the inherent abilities of those children and then guide them as they enter teenagehood. It's in the teenage years that they begin to uh, choose the subjects that they are better at and begin to narrow down so that they are now uh, they are now left with subjects that can guide them towards a particular career but many parents refuse to watch their children and be conversant with the inherent abilities of the children and the subjects in which they thrive easily but when they now get to teenagehood and it's time to narrow down and choose courses that will direct their careers they now begin to make choices for the children based on their own feelings and other kinds of sentiments. This puts them at longer heads with their teenagers. It is essential for parents to watch their children, help them identify their inherent abilities so that it can guide them towards their career choice. The schools should also provide counselors in the schools that the children can be free to walk up to. Many things that child, teenagers would want their parents to know, they are not often free to tell these parents these things. So they need other significant adults that they can relate well with. And a very secure one will be the guidance counselor provided by the school. This counselor helps the teenager to be able to unburden their minds in different areas, particularly in this wise, their choice of career. So whatever the restraints, whatever the constraints, the parents, whatever the obstacles, the parents are putting up at home that is troubling the child, the child has somebody else outside that cares for the child, listens to the child, guides the child towards a career the child can excel at. So it is essential for parents to start when their teenagers are still children, to begin to nurture and guide them towards certain careers based on their inherent abilities. Don't wait until your children have entered teenagehood before you start uh, dragging their choice of careers with them. It will only make you their enemies. I you say that Nigeria has uh, sufficient facilities. The curriculum has already been adjusted to accommodate multiple vocational subjects. Do you think that the facilities available can cater to this to address the, the needed uh, solution? It, it, it cannot. It cannot. For the challenge that we have as a nation is that um, our facilities at different levels are not sufficient to meet the needs on ground. You find out that many of these vocational 
uh, vocational courses that have been involved. There are no equipment. There are no the, the environment is not there for many schools to be able to carry out these activities. And many of them just are taught at the uh, theory level with no practicals to support it. This will not help the children to have um, a total and holistic benefit from this inclusion of these courses in the curriculum. How do you ensure that your programs and initiatives are inclusive and equitable in meeting the diverse needs of teenagers from various uh, backgrounds? We are ensuring this by uh, including communities. Communities. We do not just restrict, restrict ourselves to going into elite schools. We go into private schools. We also go into government schools. Then we go to the communities themselves. We go to the grassroots and meet with parents there. We go to the grassroots and meet with the children, the teenagers there, to motivate and encourage them on this pathway to success, which is education. These are some of the ways that we have ensured. And then more, more often, we focus on the medical outreach. We focus on engaging medical outreaches in these communities because we know that if we, we take care of them medically, it will give them a good standing to be able to attend to other areas of their lives. What are the key challenges you see in the transition from adolescence to young adulthood? And how can educational institutions support this transition more effectively? The challenge there is uh, that of um, um, most times high expectations. The expectations of the teenagers are too high for when they get into young adulthood. I remember a nephew of mine was saying sometime that at a certain age, if you don't have the card, then you are a failure. I don't know how he arrived at that kind of mindset. And then in an environment where you already hear things like school has come, those narratives are not going to all go well for the young adults. It places too much pressure on the, on the, on the young adults, and then the priorities are mixed up. What the way we can help the teenagers as they go into uh, adult, young adulthood is to ensure that they have the right perspective, create an environment that celebrates hard work, create, uh, celebrates and rewards hard work, create an environment where they learn rudiments of success, which is not in the amounts of uh, the cars that you have or the houses that you have built and all that, and then place more emphasis on self-improvement. These are some of the things that we help to ease the burden of the teenagers as they approach uh, adult, uh, young adulthood. Let's reduce the pressure that we have on them. There are certain parents having sent their children to school. They burden them after uh, the, the school. They burden them with the financial responsibilities of the home and uh, the upkeep of their younger ones and all that. The burdens are getting too much there because of the poor uh, economic uh, environment and the failing social amenities that we have around us. Let's reduce the burden, financial burdens on these children. Let's create emotional stability within the home setting. These are some of the things that the teenager, the average teenager is burdened with. A lot of emotional instability exists in our homes and in our society. We need to be able to work from the family unit and create emotional stability for these teenagers. Because even at that stage of teenagehood, they have all kinds of hormonal changes. They have all kinds of things they are battling with. They are having mental changes, physical changes, and all these things are not easy on them as it were, getting into young adulthood. So when the home, the family unit is particularly sensitive to what the teenager is going through, then it will help ease them into young adulthood properly. How do we address the issue of substance abuse and other risk behaviors among the teenagers? And what are the preventive oh, measures? That is, <laughs> yeah. that is a very, very crucial crucial area for the teenagers <clears throat> last week i got a, a phone call and i was told about a 34 year old man that has been into substance abuse since the age of 17. so half of his life he has battled with substance abuse and his mother has taken him from pillar to post from Lagos, they came to Abuja two, uh, last month or how many months ago. They have gone to rehabilitation centers all over, in Guagualada, in Lagos, all over. 
this boy started substance abuse at the age of 17. So half of his life has been wasted. His life has not amounted to anything because of substance abuse. We can only bring such examples to the hearing of our teenagers to know that the path of substance abuse is the path of distraction and destruction. Substance abuse will lure them away from a successful life. It will lure them away from a reasonable life. We need to be very careful as parents to keep pushing, to keep advocating, to keep talking to them. We need to, as parents, take a front row seat in the lives of our teenagers and help them understand the intricacies of, uh, of the life that we live in. So many distractions. I remember talking to a teenager several years ago on substance abuse. And the child was already taking, the teenage boy, he was already taking weed. And this boy was telling me that uh, Obama too takes weed. He's, he's a successful man. This person, he was mentioning names of different people. I was wondering, I had to ask him, that how come? Was he there with all these people he's mentioning when they were taking this weed? Because they are, he said, because the examples me I'm giving him are examples of people that have gone into uh, uh, smoking and uh, all kinds of vices and they have not tried in their giving careers. And he was there giving me examples of people that have taken these things and, have still, and are still thriving. So I came to the conclusion with him, telling him that, fine, you have given me your own divide. I have given you my own divide. If you continue on this path, what assures you that you will, <clears throat> you will be on your own divide and not on my own divide of the negative impact? And then he began to think about it and ruminate. I asked him how he was getting the substance. He said it was through friends. So parents, we need to know the friends our children are moving with. We need to know their friends. We need to be able to vouch for their friends somehow because of what we know about them. Peer pressure and all kinds of things will lure away teenage can lure away teenagers into vices. But uh, with guidance, with prayers, with uh, equipping ourselves with the right information, so that we can further uh, disseminate to these teenagers, <clears throat> that is the way we can go in order to protect them, help shield them from the social corruption that we have on our streets. So what future trends do you foresee? in the field of teenage education and how can we prepare for this challenge? Hmm. The, the, the trend I see is in this area of technology. Technology has become a great distraction for our children. They get into all kinds of vices based on their smart intellect, smart ability in the digital space. We need to, parents need to rise up to begin to prepare for the greater challenges that are out there. The organization I was talking to you about, where I'm the Vice President of Women Committee in Africa, our campaign this year is about safety of our children on the cyberspace. These are some of the things that we foresee. There's a lot of bullying and stalking on the cyberspace. The digital world will keep booming. So parents need, and educators, we need to be abreast of what is happening in the digital space. We need to be abreast on the increase in technology and how it affects the teenagers, how it affects the society at large. This issue of cloning, AI cloning, this is the impact of technology on the exam practice and things like that. Those are the things that we need to be able to stay abreast of, foreseeing that in the few years to come, technology will prove greater challenges for these teenagers. It's first and foremost serving as a distraction for them in achieving other productive area in, uh, areas of their lives. And much more, it will continue. Look at the free fraud, advanced fraud, internet fraud. It's on the increase. And you have younger people engaging in it. Recently, there was a debate of a boy that was caught, one, a one boy that was caught, and people said he was seven years old. They later discovered he was 19. These are the things that teenagers are involved in. And the challenge going forward is in being able to exercise self-control in the use of technology, self-control in the in, 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 in the in the embracing of the negative impact of the technology. We as parents, we as educators, we must stay abreast. It is no longer adequate for educators 
not to be conversant with technology. It shouldn't be the case any longer because going forward, greater challenges are ahead based on uh, uh, technological advancement. So how can uh, the public get in touch with the organization and follow your activities? Okay, we have uh, different platforms. We have the WhatsApp parenting platform where we engage parents on uh, issues that concern parenting. We have uh, a Facebook page also where we bring up discussions on issues that concern children and their development. We also have a YouTube channel where different videos are out there, just helping children and parents to see how they can uh, uh, be better. So what will be your part in short? Uh, parents, we need to arise. The challenge is enormous, but parenting has never been easy at any time. So our own peculiar challenges that we have now must be faced out. We must be intentional about raising children that will be role models in the society, children that will bring the peace that we desire as a people, children that will stand out and bring glory and honor to so first of all themselves, the family, and then our nation at large. The ball is in, your, is in our court as parents. We must learn to keep it right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adeto Dab, the Executive Director at Children Impact and Development Initiative. In the past hour, we've been discussing teenage education, and it seems that the responsibility of teenage education lies more in parents than any other person in the society. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful, enlightening conversation. Um, Thank you. For, uh, I've been the host of the Salama Mo. Try to keep in touch with our uh, other news, education related information on edusalab.com and catch up with future episodes of the education podcast on edusalab.com as well as our social media pages that are showing on the screen. The next time, bye.